Like my life is never really silent. First, what I didn't know what it was, I just thought I was like crazy. I can just almost like feel like you're going insane. For people that I love, I just feel rage. It's what I've been dealing with and it's been hard, but I've found ways to cope with it. Misophonia is characterized by an extreme sensitivity to specific sounds, usually soft sounds, and people with misophonia have a very intense physical and emotional response to these triggers. What it basically is, is when I hear certain sounds, I get an anxiety reaction and it causes a lot of stress and anger. To the best of our knowledge, it is a neurological condition. There's been very little research so far, but what little there has been has identified a particular area in the brain that reacts to sounds in a different way than people who don't have misophonia. At first, what I didn't know what it was, I just thought I was like crazy. Usually the first reaction when they find out that there's actually something called misophonia is a sense of relief and oh my gosh it's a real thing i'm not crazy it's an actual real thing misophonia is not ringing in the ears or a sensitivity to loud noises those are both different problems that are sometimes in the same person but are not related to misophonia misophonia is not just annoyances and it's not something that we can really control and we can't just oh block it out and just forget about it so some people uh, when someone says oh i have misophonia and it causes this extreme rash oh yeah i know i have that too and I, there, I don't like the sound of this or that so misophonia is not just disliking a sound or disliking something that's irritating Misophonia is a condition that once it develops it causes an involuntary emotional and physical reaction to the stimulus. I'd say another common misconception about people with misophonia is they are being dramatic or high maintenance or you know some be I've heard parents describe children as being bratty and that is also not the case. They're actually really struggling quite a lot emotionally when they experience a trigger. Misophonia is not being overly sensitive and dramatic and making things up for attention. It affects your life constantly and I think a lot of people really have no idea what it is. They've either never heard about it or they've heard about it and think that's, oh, that's for crazy people or dramatic people, but it's a real disorder. can be literally any sound. It's not everyone that reacts to a breathing or an eating sound, but that's the most common. It can also be any visual image that's associated with sound or not. My most common triggers are eating sounds, uh, crunching, slurping, swallowing. The sounds and sights of people eating, like the jaw movement, the little mouth noises, um, Watching people bring food to their mouth. Coughing, sneezing, sniffing, loud breathing through the nose, even occasionally through the mouth, snoring. Like mechanical pencils on like, uh, like wood or on paper, like in the classroom. Like hair picking, um, or people just like playing with their hair, and then also people biting their nails and with their fingers in their mouths. Doesn't matter who it's with, it's just if I hear one of those trigger noises, it kind of just sets me off. So when someone with misophonia is triggered, there's activation of the autonomic nervous system or the fight or flight system. And that is something that happens automatically. It's involuntary. Um, so we're gonna want to fight and that's the, we have the anger response there or get out of the situation. And so I think it's important for people with misophonia as well as friends and family members to know that that's a part of the response. 
when certain sounds are heard. The person has the kind of reaction you would have if you were in an emergency situation where you get filled with adrenaline so that you would theoretically be able to get out of some danger even though this, the danger may be somebody eating Doritos. What's misophonia like? Well, here's my little rubber band. And so um, it's a jolt to the body almost. It's like crunch, crunch, crunch. That's enough. People often say, well, just control it, right? Just don't react. And uh, the emotion and the physiological distress is not controllable. There's a little bit of control and it varies from person to person as to how much control they have. They can't just not pay attention to it or just ignore it or just stay calm. Uh, it, it's happening to them rather than something they're choosing to, be, to do. When I hear or see a trigger, it's very overwhelming. It's an immediate flood of emotions and I usually feel um, panicked. like. It's the most important thing and I just need to get away as quickly as possible and I'm filled with an unreasonable amount of anger like for people that I love I just feel rage and that also comes with a lot of guilt because I don't want to hurt people around me but sometimes with such an overpowering reaction there's really it feels like there's nothing you can do. It's like being next to a super loud speaker all the time and it's painful actually. <laughs> Basically it's hard to think, it's hard to control. There's sort of a, a big stress of a big stress and a lot of anger kind of building up and the longer I wait the more it happens. When it was really bad in like early high school, middle school, it was like slamming doors like like yelling you know all that kind of stuff so maybe like throwing something just a little bit that was like the most extreme but yeah um physically i start to distract myself like clawing at my hand i start hyperventilating a little i kind of start feeling it like in my gut and up my throat like when you are about to get on a roller coaster and you're just nervous and scared and then if it keeps on happening and I'm just like, it's hard for me to ignore it. I'm just like staring at that person and it starts to build up and eventually I'll either leave, which would be best, or I just can't control it anymore and I need to release all that build up and I, I'll get really angry. <laughs> In a lot of ways, my misophonia makes me feel trapped. Like, there's all these things that I won't be able to do, at least to the most that I could do them if I didn't have it. And they also make me feel lonely, that no one can really understand, but also that just I have to separate myself from the fun things that other people are doing and I can't live with other people that is that easily because it's too painful. When I'm around people and I have to put headphones in, or I can't be around them, I just feel really lonely and left out. For the longest time, I was just angry that I had it. I just I thought it was unfair. It put a block to a lot of things in my life. I would contemplate in the future, like, will I have kids if it's genetic? Do I want to make them go through that? Or will I ever get married if I can't stand snoring, you know? Once I started to realize that this was something that was, wasn't going to be temporary, it it saddens me to know because I know I'm, I'm going to have to deal with it for the rest of my life, potentially. The teenage years is probably the hardest time to have misophonia. It's been said that the teenage years is the age of raging hormonal imbalance, the, that you're dealing with all kinds of new things and all kinds of stress and tension and anxiety normally, plus the misophonia on top of that, is just extremely difficult for a teenager. A lot of people, you know, because go, you're going through puberty, you are hormonal, a lot of people just think it's that, you're just hormonal. A lot of people won't take you seriously because you're a teenager. 
a lot of people don't understand. They think you're just a moody teenager looking for excuses and when you put your headphones in, you know, they think you're ignoring them when in reality, you're not. You're just trying to deal with this disorder. I'm constantly surrounded by other people my age who either don't know about it or have misconceptions about it and people my age are especially judgmental so it's hard to talk to people and trust that they're going to be empathetic and truly understand where I'm coming from. I had, I had a, one situation I was at like a, like I had a party at like high school and a couple friends of mine knew and they um you know, they'd ask me like three times during it, like, oh, you're like, are we bothering you at all? Like the music or something like that? I'm like, no, like, and I, I, I didn't get angry at them, but like, it, it was a good thing because like they knew, like they were understanding and like it was from their heart and stuff, but it was just kind of like, it's kind of embarrassing. Like, you know, you don't even ask me like every three minutes. Like, I'll tell you when like I needed to walk out or I'll do it myself. Like, you don't need to like check up on me like every like five minutes and be like, oh, are you okay? So it, it was from a good place, but you know, it's just, I think it takes some time for people to understand. Like, it's not all the time. So when I'm at school, it's, it's an environment where I can't really escape from anything. If I'm in a classroom and someone's clicking their pen for 10 minutes, I can't just walk out of the classroom. And it's hard for me to eat with my friends if some of them are especially loud chewers, but I can't just desert my friends at lunchtime. So some unique challenges I face is, is wearing headphones in class, noise canceling headphones, and making hearing the teacher a lot harder because then I can't get the work done as well and I have to use my what I did hear and see if I can figure it out which definitely makes learning a lot harder. Like in a testing environment when the stakes are already really high and you're already stressed out and it's completely quiet and then someone to the left of you starts chewing gum to help themselves like focus and it makes you not focus I personally have had that happen a lot of times and I kind of just like look at them and I'm like, mm, I don't know what to do now. It does get easier, you know? When I was in eighth grade, it was the worst. It was like, I would just cry going to school every day because I knew I'd have to sit through like six hours of torture. But it being, going into high school, it's been so much easier that some days I don't even I don't even have a problem. I had a really close teacher. That was my leadership teacher. He responded really well. He'd help me a lot through it. Um, not a lot of them like pushed me to kind of get over it or just to try, but they understood like that I needed my space and stuff, so. I took a college course my first quarter at UCLA and on the second lecture, the professor came in chewing gum. So I didn't know how I was going to listen what he had to say and not start crying. So I had to go up to him and ask him to stop and explain why, which doesn't usually go well. And thank goodness he actually spit out his gum and he was very res respectful about the whole thing. But there's just a lot of instances like that where I'm talking to someone who rightfully is like above me and I should be deferential to them, but they are hurting me and I cannot do what they want me to do if they don't help me. And that's probably the hardest thing to do. When I'm getting to know people and I think to myself, wow, like I really like them and I'd like to build a relationship with them, whether it's like with friends or like peers in school. And then out of nowhere, I get triggered by something they do and all those thoughts in my mind are turned negative about them and I know that they're good people but for some reason in those moments I hold like nothing but resentment against them and I feel really bad about it. And it's preventing me from doing anything with other people because I'm afraid of hearing people sniff. One of the big things people want to do is go eat something and I love to be a part of that. I love to hang out with my friends but it means that I'll be like a step away from them. With my friends, uh, they just, they can't really get it and they don't know how to deal with me having it. It's a very sensitive topic, so I don't really tell people about it unless I need to. And with my friends, it's hard because they don't quite understand. I was like really self-conscious of inviting friends over because I'd be scared if like, you know, my mom would just like start eating chips, but my, my friend was just 
my friend would be sitting like right there, we'd play, be playing video games, and I'd be worried if like, I wouldn't have a freak out, but you know, it's really, really uncomfortable, and so you don't want to have that feeling with someone who doesn't know that you have it, and you don't want to explain it. I didn't want to explain all that to him, so I didn't really have anyone over besides maybe like two close friends for like, like years, middle school and high school. So I told like my best friend, she's one person who always knows, and whenever we're somewhere together, and I like tell her like, having a problem, you know, like she'll help me. it's helpful to think about misophonia as a family issue rather than an individual issue. So the, the entire family is affected by misophonia, whether that is because family dinners aren't happening or even certain family events or activities like going to the movies are not pleasurable for the person with misophonia, that means they're usually not pleasurable for anyone else in the family because everyone is affected. Sometimes teens are able to manage themselves better when they're out with other people and they just kind of grit their teeth and tolerate whatever they have to do because they can't afford emotionally to blow up at a friend. So they tend to hold on to it until they get home, then they blow up at everybody at home. I kind of feel like when I come in the room then people have to restrain themselves in a way that they don't when I'm not in the room. Funny story that they tried to do when I was first figuring all this out was we had a bell on the kitchen counter that they would ring if they wanted to start eating as a way of warning me. And didn't really work because my mom and my brother forgot to do it or like did it after they started eating, which didn't help. But my dad would always ring it extra loud to make sure that I heard. It's, it's really important and helpful for family members to know that it is not personal and that most people are triggered by someone who they are very close with, someone they love very much. So, so often we see and hear that, you know, the mom is the biggest trigger or dad is the biggest trigger or a sister or brother. And it's really painful for that family member because they may feel like the person living with misophonia hates them or it just can't stand them and um, and, and it's it's really not that it's just that being around these triggers can be so painful for the person with misophonia that they they may start to avoid or they may have you know angry outbursts around the person or a lot of irritability so one time I was um, having dinner with my whole family my grandparents and um, I was sitting next to my great grandpa and he just started eating and like I wish I could have let that go because it was one of the last times we had had a family dinner together but I had to leave the table and I felt so bad about it. I've sat in the car while my family's in restaurants and I've you know spent Christmas Eve in my room alone which is sad and it I feel bad because I'm isolating myself and I, I want to be with other people but it's just not an option for me in the moment. I think a big thing was um, like with family, family uh, dinners with like my grandparents and cousins and all that is like, um, like I, feel, I realized like family is a lot more important I think as the years went on and so like it's, it's not worth it to waste time like running away from stuff. They're not reacting to you personally even though it darn well feels like it so not taking it personally is difficult but it's helpful not running guilt trips against this person because they're gonna feel bad enough and guilty enough once they calm down they're gonna feel terrible that they blew up at somebody that they care about so I think it's really important to communicate about it to talk about um, talk openly as a family about what the triggers are and what experiences are pleasant and pleasurable versus which experiences are just ex extremely distressing. So really cooperating as a family, uh, empathy, understanding that they're having you know great distress and, and emotional pain and agony from it, not forcing them to be exposed to uh, triggers cooperating with environmental controls, having fans and noise in the home, things and not eating in the car. That would be one sort of a thing, but really looking at the misophonia as a real condition. I wish
wish that when I told people about my misophonia, they could just understand and they wouldn't think that it's just annoyances. I think people who are struggling with this really just need people to give them space and not take it personally. And I know that that can be hard because, you know, when you get a reaction, it's so big you don't even think about how you're treating the people around you. You might give a really mean look without realizing it or you might like jump suddenly, but I want people to just treat me with the same respect that they treat everyone else with and to understand that a mental disorder is really not that different from a physical illness or an injury or something. I'd like them to just try not to walk on eggshells around me because it's kind of impossible for them to not make any of my trigger sounds and them knowing that I have it, I don't want them to be afraid of being around me and I just like them to understand overall that if I start getting a little angry or they can tell I'm being a little annoyed with them, just not to take it personally, even though like that's really hard. The ideal way like for someone to like, if I told a friend or a family member that I had it, would just be, like I said, understanding and just saying like, that's totally okay, but not bringing like a huge deal to it. But probably my ideal response to get would be, okay, how can I help you? That's probably the best thing someone can say like I say, like, I have misophonia, and they say, okay, how can I help you? Like, that would be incredible to have that kind of awareness. I, we are not there yet, but that would be my favorite thing to hear. I definitely need sound. There always has to be at least some kind of sound to reassure myself that nothing will happen because a lot of times uh, if it's super quiet, I'll think, oh, something's gonna happen and, and I get extra sensitive. My most helpful tools when coping with misophonia would definitely be headphones. And that's mainly my earbuds. So that was one way of coping with it 24 seven, which is constant headphones. For sure, it's my Bose noise canceling headphones playing music and then also playing white noise because with the white noise I can hear conversations but I can't hear the eating sounds and so that has been a big help on my life. Once I got those and I got the white noise app on my phone and I made a special mix of rain sounds and stuff, I could eat dinner with my family again and it was such a happy moment and I still like remember it so well the first time I had dinner and I wasn't in pain and that's definitely the tool I found that has made a lot more things possible that wouldn't have been otherwise. So the main thing I do because it's just the easiest for me in situations is I, I to plug my ear, I go like this, like I'm resting my hand on my fist. And I actually went to a misophonia doctor in Oregon and she told me you know, if, to carry around corn nuts, and if someone's chewing, just chew louder, you know? Chew, you know, eat the corn nuts you can hear in your ear. Carry around gum, just chew louder. Try your hardest to focus in on other noises. When I experience a trigger and I don't have my headphones with me, I usually will try and just like take a deep breath and try like a calming exercise. The simplest, fastest, easiest, first thing I teach everybody is something called paced breath or paced breathing. You inhale some amount and you exhale more than that. So inhale five, exhale seven, or it doesn't matter what the numbers are. What it does is it switches the brain from the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight flight side, to the parasympathetic, which is the calm down, relax side. It does that automatically and almost instantly. If this is your misophonia severity, and this is your health and well-being, as your health and well-being goes up, your misophonia goes down. As your stress level goes up, your misophonia goes up. So good sleep, good diet, exercise, um, daily progressive muscle relaxation training or mindfulness, these are things that can help you feel better and your misophonia can be less. 
one strategy is identifying and learning to identify the thoughts and the feelings that happen in those moments. So if, if you're triggered and you just feel completely out of control and you don't understand your experience, it's harder to cope with it. But if you're able to say, I was just triggered, my heart is racing, my stomach is tight, I'm really hot and sweaty, my, my fists are clenched and I feel so angry and disgusted and really want to get out of this situation. Just identifying the facts of what is happening can really help one to cope with it and to pause so that they respond more effectively. It really helps me to not focus on the person's flaws in doing the trigger because that's normally what happens. I try to imagine all the things that they could be going through in their personal life that makes them seem more human to me. <laughs> um, so I try to imagine things they can be struggling with, things that I'm struggling with that they probably are too, and it helps me calm down and realize that they're not trying to make me angry, and it really helps. I also want to take into account, like, maybe this person needs to be chewing gum or needs to be moving their foot so they can concentrate and that's okay. It's just like keep internally encouraging yourself, just being like, just like you can do it, just like just sit through it, it's gonna be fine. Really what I need is just space, so having space and quiet is the most helpful. And I think it can be helpful to have a to have a, a trigger-free place you can go to, so whether that's a certain room in the house or a certain area that tends to be free of triggers. I think if you have that or can create that, it can help you cope cope with the triggers when they do happen because you know you have your little getaway space. My escape from misophonia is anything that I can do by myself and recently that's been painting and it's just so satisfying because I can be my, by myself and it's something I do just based on my thoughts and it could have to do with my emotions because of misophonia and just putting like the paintbrush to the paper is something like so satisfying and just having it like go and flow so smoothly is something that takes a lot of stress away. My favorite way to escape from misophonia would be playing my music, drawing, or going for a bike ride. <laughs> when I do these things, I just, I feel like I'm in my own world and I can block everything out and I'm just with me and I'm with my art and it's nice. <laughs> To escape and de-stress from misophonia, I like to read just because it kind of takes me out of my head and into other worlds where I don't really have to think about that. I played a lot of sports in high school. I worked out a lot, that was a good thing. I started getting all into fitness. I kind of count that as a hobby, it's just like watching what you eat and like just being healthy all the time. It like really makes your body feel better and, physic and just physical activity makes you feel better in general. So I feel like when those noises come around, it doesn't really affect you as much. I dance, so I go to dance classes often, so it's somewhere where I can just be myself and do something and live my life without having problems. Okay, so what I like to do is definitely just fiddle with some code, try something new, and either build something in real life to combine with that code, or I like to just code a game in general. The way it helps me is just, I think, it's my brain's too busy to think about the misophonia and it's just busy working on what I'm dedicated to working on. People with misophonia tend to be smart, very, very smart. They have an attention to detail that is remarkable. They tend to have much higher ability to notice differences and details that can turn into an incredible tool and valuable resource. I think, in a way, it's made me more aware of my surroundings and aware of how other people feel, and I can relate to them in some kind of way. I'd say misophonia affected my life because it taught me understanding of like other people's problems a lot. Like, you know, like it's really 
cliche, but like no matter where people come from, like you never know what's going on because I hit it a lot. And so then I could see other people in high school that, you know, would hide stuff and it wouldn't even be misophonia, it would be something else, you know, I could, I could became more understanding. And I think, I think the biggest thing is, I think it taught me a lot about toughness and that I applied that same mentality to a lot of the other things in life challenges, so. I think it would be easier for me and for everyone to not really manage whatever emotions they're dealing with, but I think it's a really important skill for everyone, you know, anger management and being able to cope with difficult things and still treat other people kindly, and I think that misophonia has given me an opportunity to work on that. What I would tell everyone to do is definitely understand the way your your misophonia is. If you can understand it well, then you can understand how you can try and create solutions to help what fits you because everyone who has misophonia is definitely different. It is livable and you can um, work on yourself and help yourself and, and learn to do the things that you need to do to have a healthy, happy, fulfilling life and um, and to not let this condition become life limiting or life restricting. I'd like you to remember that today is not forever. That with misophonia, reactions can decrease, so don't give up, keep working at it, and uh, you know, hope on, because we have good reasons for hope. Yeah, I think, honestly, it's just like, has to come from yourself, and just like, bringing forward that you're gonna like, like, persevere through this like, difficult time. Spend time with your family, friends, just be tough about it, and um, just have a positive outlook on it, you know. You're going to learn a lot about yourself and about how much you can take and how much you can deal with. And down the line, you're going to learn how to cope with it better. And no matter like what relationships you have, surrounding yourself with people who understand is going to be really helpful and you deserve people like that in your life. Really one of the most harmful things you can do is to bully yourself about it because it's already hard enough to have to deal with the disorder so just make sure that you're you're being gentle with yourself as you get older um, people become mature and more understanding it gets easier to tell people but it will definitely become more minimal in your life try to talk to someone about it um, do research tell your parents about it and I think it will really make a difference. It honestly makes me feel really good because I'm sharing something personal to me and I get to tell other people about it. <laughs> know that you're not alone and know that what you're feeling is valid and that there are people who understand and even if it seems like no one does or that you're crazy, we've all been there and you don't have to think that. You're, you're right you are feeling these things and it sucks but you can also get through it so i really hope that you found the stories from these incredible teenagers as empowering as i did really my main takeaway from this is that we aren't alone and we're actually far from that we have the power as a community to come together and rather than letting our misophonia isolate us we can use it to connect and build powerful solutions that will take us into the future.